Hello and welcome to Healthmark's seven days of CEUs, where we're celebrating you, the sterile processing technician, and your contributions to patient safety. For each day of CS Week, one of Healthmark's educators will be presenting an educational video worth one CEU that you can use towards your recertification. It's just Healthmark's small way of saying thank you for everything that you do to save patients' lives and for being the heartbeat of the hospital. So with that, happy CS Week, and let's get to today's video. Hello, everybody. My name is Adam Okada, Clinical Education Specialist with Healthmark Industries, and welcome to another one of our seven days of CE educational videos for you, the sterile processing technician, as we celebrate all your contributions to patient safety here on CS Week 2022. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to get right into storage and transportation, the top 10 things you need to know. So once again, my name is Adam Okada, Clinical Education Specialist with Healthmark Industries. And just some disclosures here to start off. Uh, I am an employee of Healthmark Industries. Um, it's a manufacturer and distributor of medical products to healthcare facilities and healthcare professionals. No compensation has been received for this presentation. Any opinions I give are the opinions of me, not necessarily of my employer. And this presentation is not intended to be used as a training guide or as promotion. Before using any medical device, please review the relevant package inserts with particular attention to the indications, contraindications, warnings, and precautions, as well as the steps for use of the device. Just look at your IFUs. Anything I say here uh, might be guidance. It might point you in the right direction as far as where to look for more information. So if you're looking for any guidelines, I may stay a couple passages from it. But if you want to get a better understanding, it's really great to look at the documents themselves. And Healthmark's policy has always been to provide our customers as well as the healthcare community with the highest quality, state-of-the-art medical products and support services in a timely and cost-effective manner. And this goal is supported by a staff that's really committed to individual accountability, professionalism, mutual respect, collaboration, as well as service excellence. And this presentation is part of our commitment, educating our customers, and really it's a part to say thank you to you, the sterile processing technician. We know you're on the front lines every day fighting against the pathogens that can harm patients. So we just want to say thank you for everything you do to take care of those people every single day. Let's look at some objectives for our presentation here. We're going to describe transportation steps of soiled items from the point of use to decontamination. We're also gonna explore required parameters for sterile storage as well as high level disinfection items. And we're gonna review where the sterile storage process begins as well as how to maintain that sterility all the way to the point of use. So we all know how vitally important cleaning, disinfection, sterilization steps are to keeping patients safe. But of all the steps in the reprocessing cycle, it's often the transportation and sterile storage steps where items are overlooked and they can possibly become infection risks. So in this presentation, we're going to address how to keep soiled items safe for transportation, what parameters are required for sterile storage, and what steps we can take to maintain that sterility all the way to the point of use. We focus so much on doing a great job in decontamination and cleaning our items effectively, making sure they're safe for handling on the clean side. We do a really good job in the inspection and assembly side. We look at our instrumentation. Hopefully we've got those advanced inspection tools and we really try to do a really good job to test them for functionality as well as cleanliness. And then we package them and we wrap them and we sterilize them and make sure that those things are sterile and then it's almost like we forget about the last step in the process, which is getting those sterile items to the storage and then maintaining that sterility to the point of use. And from the point of use back to decon, another step that's often skipped uh, as far as point of use treatment, removing uh, any kind of soil at the point of use. Those are just steps in the process that are just as important as everything we've done to get there. So I'm really passionate about sterile storage and transportation. I'm really excited to get into this presentation with you guys. Let's look at our objective one, which is describing the transportation steps of soiled items from the point of use to decontamination. So there are main goals of soiled instrument or scope transportation, four of them actually. Four main goals of soiled instrumentation, equipment, or scope transportation from the point of use. The first one is going to be the removal of gross soil. And gross soil is a little bit of a nonsense term. Uh, gross essentially just means a large amount. 
Uh, I've discussed this with a lot of different sterile processing professionals over the years. What is gross? Uh, it's very similar to the copious amounts of water. If you've ever seen those in the IFU, use copious amounts of water. Well, that doesn't help me. I'm not exactly sure what a copious amount is. Removal of gross soil is a very similar term. The way I describe it is if it's a large amount of soil, if you see an instrument and it's covered in soil, that's gross soil. So you want to remove that gross soil. Now, if there's little bits of it left, a little streak or a little spot of blood that's left behind, that's not as big of a deal. As long as the pretreatment spray is used, the tiny amounts of soil left aren't going to be a big deal. But removing the big chunks of it, removing that visible stuff, that is going to be huge as far as not damaging instruments and making sure that biofilm doesn't start to form on our instrumentation. The second main goal of soiled instrument transportation is going to be the prevention of damage of the items being transported. Hospitals invest huge amounts of money, up to $100,000 sometimes for some of these video flexible endoscopes. So we need to make sure we're preventing damage to these instruments as we're bringing them down. I'm going to show you guys in a few slides some examples of how that damage occurs during the transportation process. Again, we've done such a great job up to this point. Why do we forget during the transportation step to take care of our instruments? Another huge part of it is going to be cross-contamination. We do not want anything biohazardous that's inside of our carts or inside of our transport containers. We do not want that getting out into public hallways. Uh, we don't want any kind of patient walking down the hallway, uh, opening up our carts to see what's inside, making sure we have labeling on it's going to be important. And that's all part of keeping others safe. The fourth part about the four main goals of soiled instrument transportation. So when we talked about the top 10 things you need to know, I wasn't kidding about that. We're gonna go through each one of the top 10 things that I feel you need to know for the sterile storage and transportation process. The first one here is how many main goals are there to soiled instrument scope process or soiled instrument or scope transportation? And the answer is four. We just saw that in the previous screen. Removal of gross soil, prevention of damage, prevention of cross-contamination, and keeping others safe. So let's start with that first part, the removal of gross soil at the point of use. And we kind of got into what is gross soil. And it's a little bit of a, well, it's tough to define, but I know it when I see it. I know what gross soil is when I look at it, because it's usually chunks of stuff sitting on instrumentation that I know in sterile processing is going to be a huge, huge problem. Not just because it's gonna be hard to clean. That's absolutely true. It's gonna take me a long time to clean some of these instruments. I have to soak it in enzymatic. I do, I do a really good job of brushing under the water line. And some of these things are just gonna take repeated soaking, cleaning steps to get off because this gross soil was not removed at the point of use. It's interesting to also think about this, that according to the Amy standards, they're actually pretty lax as far as gross soil at the point of use. If you look at AST or AORN guidelines about removal of gross soil at the point of use, they're very specific. You need to do cleaning, decontamination at the point of use. You need to disassemble items and make sure they're clean and safe. And really that's what they do in the scrub techs. Scrub techs need to be cleaning things off, handing them back to the surgeons and then cleaning them off before sending them down to SPD. This is just part of the deal and removal of gross soil is gonna be part of that. So according to Amy ST79, gross soil should be removed as soon as possible to reduce the number of microorganisms on the item. We also wanna reduce the nutrient material that supports microbial growth. We're gonna prevent that soil from drying on the instruments. We wanna reduce the potential for environmental contamination by aerosolation or spillage. We also want to remove any disposables, including any kind of disposable sharps, and we're going to try to minimize the corrosion risk and damage to devices from substances like blood, saline, iodine, and radiological dyes, or from the subsequent vigorous cleaning processes that we're going to need to do in order to remove that encrusted material. So there's a lot of reasons behind it, biofilm, damage to instruments, all of those things apply. Really, it needs to be done. It's really the most important step in this um, prevention of damage is gonna be that removal of gross soil at the point of use. But let's get into prevention of damage too. This is another one of those where I think a picture says the thousand words. OR technicians, if you're watching, this is not what we want to see when we have instruments come down to us in decontamination. That's not a knock. I know that this probably was a scrub tech or somebody who was running out of time and didn't have time to do things correctly, but 
honestly, this is the easiest and fastest way to get your hospital to pay a lot of money for instrumentation that they could have been spending on something else. So we see here on the left-hand side, we're gonna see uh, scopes and things like that sitting underneath um, instrumentation, right? We see metal instruments. Here's a, la here's a laparoscopic with insulation sitting underneath metal instrumentation. Uh, the scope damage, the um, insulation damage, not to mention we've got broken tape over here. Uh, watch out for that as well. But a lot of damage could be occurring inside of this set. And then of course, over here on the right-hand side, I see an implant tray with no lid. That's gotta be a danger. This is not the correct uh, orientation for this tray. It should not be sitting sideways in this cart with everything sort of leaning um, on it. Uh, just a lot of damage can occur from transporting instruments like this. So we wanna make sure we're doing a good job of transporting items, prevention of damage of these expensive items is just really a big part of keeping these instruments good for safe reuse on patients. What we need to do and the things that would fix that previous slide, if we have instruments that can go inside of some type of carrying case where they're fixed, we need to do that. Scopes, laparoscopic instruments, especially flexible scopes, if they have little notches in the scope tray where they can fit inside, don't let them just slide around inside of an open container put them in these fixed containers for, that's what they're for. They're for the prevention of damage during transportation. So let's use them as that. Then we also have the enclosed case carts, which will uh, hopefully prevent them from damage. Um, as long as things are enclosed in individual cases, then we put them in the carts. And the one on the right-hand side, the, the latched container, if you've got a small amount of instruments, let's say you're going from a clinic or you're going from a smaller area where you don't really need a full case cart, we do have transportation containers as well that can help us transport from one area to another, preventing damage along the way. That's gonna bring us into the top 10 things you need to know number two. The question is what type of container should be used to transport soiled or dirty items? and it's gotta be a latched biohazard labeled container. So if your case cart is latched, that's great. Label it as a biohazard because it's got biohazardous materials inside. We don't wanna, we wanna prevent that cross contamination. We don't want patients in a public hallway seeing a case cart and thinking, I wonder what's in here. Let me go investigating in the hospital and find out. Usually if they see that biohazard symbol on the case cart, they will avoid it. Same thing with the, the latched container there with the red container. We saw that if we're transporting items, we wanna make sure they're in some type of latched and some sort of biohazard labeled container as they're coming down to SPD. We're avoiding that cross-contamination and it's really gonna be a part of keeping others safe. And if we're transporting sharps, by the way, add the term puncture resistant to that list. So if there are sharp items that you're transporting, make sure the container is puncture resistant. That's the reason we wanna label and latch these things. We wanna make sure that we are keeping others safe. That's the huge part about this. So by removing soil, by securing all that instrumentation to prevent movement or damage, by enclosing them in latched biohazard labeled containers, we should accomplish our main goal of keeping others safe. So pop quiz, hot shot, top 10 things you need to know, number three. What organization has regulations for the transportation of biohazardous materials outside of the hospital facility? That is the Department of Transportation. As soon as you walk outside the door of the facility, now you're falling under Department of Transportation guidelines. So, and this is, the flying bus, by the way, is to complete the circle with the pop quiz hotshot reference. Uh, both of those are from the movie Speed. Uh, I'm sure the uh, millennials probably get this reference, but Gen Zers are looking at me like I'm crazy. Um, it, that's just a flying bus. Uh, but, uh, trust me, uh, if you imagine a young John Wick in an action movie on a bus, that's essentially the movie speed. That's what we're talking about here. So let's go straight into objective number two, which is we're going to explore the required parameters for sterile storage and high level disinfection items. And we're going to start with the temperature in the sterile storage area. So I wish I could give you the right temperature range for your sterile storage area. I wish I could give you the right humidity range. I wish I could give you the air exchanges. Unfortunately, the answer is not going to be that simple. From HSPA's eighth edition of the CRCST manual, the proper temperature for sterile storage is going to be less than 75 degrees. But the newest version of ST79 2017 removed the table for temperature and humidity, and instead they give this reference. The healthcare organization should identify which version of ANSI ASHRAE ASHE 170 
will be used based on when the HVAC system was initially installed or last upgraded. So it doesn't tell you a temperature. It's telling you based on your system and when it was last upgraded, that's the standards you need to follow. When we go to humidity, HSPA's 8th edition says the manual, the proper humidity for sterile storage is going to be less than 70%. And again, we're going to get into the ST79, the same message. The healthcare organization should identify which version of 170 will be uh, used based on when the HVAC system was initially installed or last upgraded. And guess what? At air exchanges, it's going to be no different. HSPA's 8th edition says the number of air exchanges is 4 but the newest edition of ST79 says you need to look at when your building was built or when it was last upgraded. So what are we talking about with temperature, humidity, and air exchanges and this ashy, ANSI ASHRAE ASHI 170 uh, document? Uh, most of us in sterile processing probably know, don't know what it is, but I guarantee your facilities team knows and understands what it is. This is kind of their document, ventilation of healthcare facilities. And the temperature, humidity, and air exchanges all go back to the ash sorry, ANSI ASHI ASHRAE standard of 170 for when your building was built. And that's gonna bring us to the top 10 things you need to know, number four. And the question is, where can I find the correct temperature, humidity, and air exchange requirements for my sterile storage area? And the answer is gonna be in the applicable ASHI ASHRAE 170 standards for when your hospital was built or last upgraded. So unfortunately, I can't give you the exact temperature, humidity, or air exchange range, but I can point you in the right direction. You need to look for your facility and the standards that apply to your facility when it was built or last upgraded. So that's been a little bit of a change. Those 170 standards came out, I think, in 2016, and they had a table in it. Um, and then Amy changed their guidelines in 2017 to remove the proper temperature and humidity table. But there are some things that have not changed in that time period. Um, so you still need to know what the proper temperature and humidity ranges are for your facility. Again, per those uh, ASHI ASHRAE standards 170. You need to have the documentation of temperature and humidity. That still has to be monitored daily. And you must keep records of this monitoring. And this is the one that I think is really key. When You, you also have to have a plan in place for what is done when temperature and humidity, temperature or humidity falls out of compliance. So you can monitor all day long. I went into a facility and I, I said, hey, are you monitoring temperature and humidity? I see this temperature and humidity um, uh, clock. It was actually part of a clock system uh, that was on the wall. And I said, you know, is this, this is how you're monitoring temperature and humidity? And they were like, yeah. And I said, that's great. Can I see your record keeping? They showed me their record keeping. It was, I mean, spot on every single day. They were marking temperature and humidity like clockwork. It was amazing. And that wasn't a pun based on the fact that it was part of a clock. It was actually really, really good documentation. But when I looked at it, I saw that the temperature had gone as high as 79 degrees, 80 degrees, 82 degrees. Some of the humidity had gone down as low as 20%, 19, 18%. And so I asked them, well, what is the, the correct uh, temperature range? And they showed me on the documentation, it should be between in prep and pack 68 to 73. That was the range they had set at the facility. And their uh, humidity was supposed to be between 30 and 60% in the prep and pack area where they were doing this documentation. And I said, well, that's great, but you're following out of this. What do you do when you fall out of uh, the correct temperature range or the correct humidity range? And they said, I don't know, we mark it, we write it down. Well, that's not exactly having a plan in place for what to do in case of that. So you have to have a plan. If something goes out of alignment, make sure your hospital knows who to call, how to fix it, so they can explain it to surveyors. If surveyors wanted to see that documentation, you would need to have an explanation of what you do in the case it does fall out of compliance. Let's look at some more sterile storage requirements for per Amy ST79, sterile items should be stored far enough away from the floor, the ceiling and outside walls to allow for adequate air circulation, ease of cleaning, as well as compliance with local fire codes. Don't worry, we're gonna get into more detail with that in a second. So sterile items should be stored at least eight to 10 inches above the floor. And then from a later section, the bottom shelf of storage carts or shelving should be solid. So that's going to bring us to number five on the top 10 things you need to know. The question is, the bottom shelf of a storage rack or transport cart must be blank. And the answer is at least eight to 10 inches from the floor. 
and it must have a solid bottom. From the same section, sterile items should be at least 18 inches below the ceiling or the level of the sprinkler heads and at least two inches from outside walls. Guess what? That's going to lead us to number six in the top 10 things you need to know. The question is the minimum open space is 18 inches between the top of the packages and the, and the answer is the ceiling or sprinkler head. So if there is no sprinkler head or if the sprinkler head is built into the ceiling, um, then it would be the ceiling. But if you do have sprinkler heads like this place here, you cannot have boxes stored that close to the ceiling. That would be a very clear violation of the 18 inches rule. And that's not just, by the way, Amy saying you need to have 18 inches between. That's usually a fire code violation. This is a really big deal. So if facilities uh, check comes and checks you during a survey, a facilities check, and they see something like that, they're absolutely going to give you a finding because that's a fire code violation. So this is what we want to see below that sprinkler head, at least 18 inches between that and the storage line. Uh, very clear, number six in the top 10 things you need to know, 18 inches between the ceiling or sprinkler head and the top of the top packages. We're gonna keep going here in Amy ST79 with our storage requirements. Sterile items should be stored in such a way that wrapped packages are not stored beneath rigid sterilization containers on the same shelf. If you have wrapped items, please do not put them on the bottom, any rigid containers stacked directly on top of it. Some of those wrapped items may not have lids. Some of those rigid containers are very, very heavy. And when you drag them or pull them off the shelf, it's probably gonna take some tape and part of the wrap with it, which is then an event that makes that item unsterile. We'll get to event-related sterility in a little bit, but it's specifically stated in the regulate or the guidelines, sorry, that we need to make sure that we're not putting rigid containers on top of wrapped items. We're gonna continue from that same section about sterile items. They should be positioned so that packaging is not crushed, bent, compressed, or punctured, and so that their sterility is not otherwise compromised. So when I look at the picture on the right, my first instinct is to say everything looks great. Everything looks good. That looks like a normal sterile storage area. Uh, I don't really have a lot of complaints about it, but it's a little bit of a where's Waldo. So once you start looking at it more, you may start to see a little bit more things that are wrong with the sterile storage area. The first one I'm gonna start with is right up there. And you can probably guess what I'm gonna say. It's too high. It does not look like it's 18 inches from the ceiling or from the sprinkler head. So I'm guessing those packages up there and especially like anything that's really close to the lighting like that, where it's very clear that it's close to the ceiling is gonna become a problem. That's not, a, uh, it's definitely in violation of fire code, definitely something a facilities surveyor is gonna catch. The second thing I saw is over here. I see kind of boxes and sterile peel pouches and a sterile wrap kind of leaning against the peel pouches. If you look at what that says on the screen, you do not want to have that packaging crushed, bent, compressed, or punctured. And if you have things stacked on top of or too many peel pouches in an area, or these things are just kind of leaning against each other, that's where you get crushed packages, compromised packages, compressed, um, and that's going to create a problem. This is not necessarily a problem. We're going to talk about the stacking of the wrap trays in a little bit, uh, what Amy says about it, and then also what is best practice for the wrapped items. But when I look at that, I also think about the weight of those items and the fact that there's probably tape on the top and the bottom of each of those packages. So we'll get into that in a little bit later, but I don't know if that many wrapped items on top of each other is going to be a great thing. And the last thing I saw was over here. There's wrapped items sticking out of the shelf and anytime you have items that are kind of sticking away from the shelf, I imagine people walking through that corridor and banging a cart into it or banging a leg or banging a shoulder into it, anything like that. But especially if you can do a cart and it's going at full speed and you hit it, that that wrap's going to be torn. Um, so anything hanging off of a shelf is a red flag that there's probably going to be some sterile issues. Um, and we talked about this early on in this presentation we can't just forget about all the things we've learned and know about sterility and sterility maintenance just because we've sterilized an item. Maintaining that sterility all the way to the point of use is a vital part of this sterile storage process. And that brings me to objective three, which is reviewing where the sterile storage process begins and how to maintain that sterility all the way to the point of use. 
So sterile storage begins as soon as items are removed from the sterilizer. As soon as we pull those items out and they start cooling, that is the sterile storage process. Those items are now sterile and we're starting the sterile storage process. Once they're removed from the sterilizer, they should be moved to a designated cooling area. And this area should be close to the sterilizers, as close as possible, because the more you move that hot cart as it comes out of the sterilizer, it's gonna cause air currents to flow over the warm items. And because the room air is cooler than those sterilized items, that movement across the room can create condensation. So we have a hot cart coming out of the sterilizer and then you take that cart all the way across the room, that's gonna be a problem. You wanna make sure that air storage area is as close as possible to the sterilizer. A lot of times we just tell people to just uh, unload it and just park it there. Let it sit there hot for about 30 minutes, get uh, kind of acclimated to the temperature. And that brings us to our next section, which is waiting for items to cool. We need to have these temperature guns, infrared guns. We see them all the time with COVID now. It should be no big deal to have them in our departments. Packages should not be touched until they reach room temperature. Touching warm packages can be cause the packages to become contaminated from microbes on the skin transferring through the warm packaging material. When items are removed from the sterilization, the steam sterilizer, there is still some steam vapor inside of those containers. And that steam vapor, if you think about what it is, it wants to pull the steam and what's ever in the outside in. That's how the steam is gonna penetrate through the wraps and the packages and is gonna contact all the surfaces inside that steam vapor. So when it's still present after the cycle and you put your hand, which has some moisture on it, that steam vapor is gonna wanna pull in the microbes from your hands inside the packages. Please don't touch uh, items until they're 100% cool. Uh, again, I've seen, uh, I used to work at a hospital where we would take uh, items out of the sterilizer and then we would grab them with our bare hands and move them to a cooling rack. Uh, and this cooling rack was where we would uh, allow them to cool faster for the OR because they wanted them quicker. And it would cool them faster, but I wonder how much damage or contamination we may have done grabbing them with bare hands and moving them to a cooling rack. So wait for the items to cool, wait for all that steam vapor to disappear. That's when it'll be safe to handle. Use your infrared gun as your uh, guideline. So event related sterility. This is something that uh, I think is very misunderstood. So I'm gonna do my best to create a little bit of clarity when it comes to event related sterility and what that means. Event related sterility is a concept and it's a concept that sterile products remain sterile until an event occurs to make them unsterile. Some people have interpreted event-related sterility to mean this, that sterility is guaranteed until the package is damaged or opened. And I, it's, it's a simple statement. I wish it had a little more nuance on it because I think there's a lot more to event-related sterility and I'm gonna try to get to convince you that event-related sterility does not mean it can stay on the shelf forever that's gonna be my purpose in these next few slides. Let's look at what Amy says about event-related sterility. So the healthcare facility should establish policies and procedures for determining shelf life. And the shelf life of facility sterilized items is event-related and should be based on the quality of the packaging material, the storage conditions, the methods and conditions of transport, and the amount and conditions of handling. Now, there's a lot to unpack there. So there's a rationale under that statement from uh, in Amy ST79. The rationale says shelf life is not simply a matter of sterility maintenance, but it's also a function of device degradation and inventory control. So when I look at that statement, the way that I interpret that rationale is that sterility maintenance, great. We're trying to prevent events that will cause the item to become unsterile. We don't want it to be wet. We don't want any tears in our packages or any holes in our wraps. That's all part of sterility maintenance. That second part, the function of device degradation, to me, that's the shelf life of the products. If your product that you're wrapping in, peel pouch, wrap, rigid container filter, whatever it is, if there's a shelf life on it, that has to do with device degradation and shelf life or expiration dates have a part of that. Now, we used to have the dating system, right? We used to date everything for one year, two years, and then everything had to come off the shelf. And we changed that to this event-related sterility. It can stay on the shelf as long as no event has made it unsterile. But we forget that the packages themselves have events that could cause them to be unsterile. If we have an expiration date on our peel pouches, 
that's an event once it hits the expiration date that now our items should not be considered sterile anymore. And then inventory control is the last part of that sentence. If you've got an item that's been sitting on the shelf for 10 years and it's still in the sterile package, that item might still be sterile. I mean, I'm, I'm depending that on whatever the package is. If there's no expiration date on it, everything has been perfect with the conditions. It's never been handled, anything like that. Possibly that thing has remained sterile all those years, but why would you want it taking up space on your shelf for that long? So you, there's got to be some form of the facility policy that needs to take into consideration the expiration date of the package, as well as the inventory control, how often these things need to come off the shelf. So there are some factors that can compromise sterility. One of them is the product life. You need to look at the expiration date of the packaging and look and see, does it have a useful shelf life, the type of material? A lot of these packaging materials do have a defined useful shelf life. Uh, with the product life and expiration dates, if you have batteries that are on the shelf, make sure that your batteries are only on the shelf for as long as the expiration date la makes them last. When they charge fully, some of them only have seven days that can be on the shelf. Some say 14, some say 28. So look at your batteries for powered equipment. Those are all have expiration dates and they're not necessarily event related because that expiration counts as the event. The condition of the package, we know this one, if the package is damaged, the contents are considered unsterile. The storage transportation condition, so if there's clean, dry shelving required uh, to keep those items sterile, we also need to look at the temperature and humidity of the room, and that should be monitored. And then handling of the product. Lack of proper handling can cause items to become unsterile. The more we handle it, the more likely it is an event will occur. We need to try to not touch these things as often as possible. Um, the less we handle it, the better for maintaining sterility. So with event-related sterility, the one thing I really want to say is there are misconceptions about what event-related sterility means. But to me, event-related sterility does not mean instruments and equipment can stay on your shelf forever. You need to have a policy and procedure in place that takes into consideration the product itself, the, the packaging materials, looking at all those different things and coming up with a policy and procedure that makes sense. Yes, events are obviously things that will cause them to become unsterile but I do believe expiration dates and shelf life testing, uh, shelf life dates are also things. So the top 10 things you need to know, number seven, true or false, under an event-related sterility policy, items in sterile storage can remain on the shelf forever. The answer is false. And I'll give you a story just real quick on an event-related sterility hospital that I was at um, and I worked at, and one of my jobs on the night shift was pulling down old instruments and repackaging them. So one day I got to an actual shelf that was in our sterile processing department. It was never used. It was on the very, very top. And there was just a lot of old instrumentation they had brought down that was no longer needed, but it stayed in the sterile packaging in the sterile processing department. When I grabbed one item off the shelf and I, the label stayed intact after this. So I was able to see the label. It was uh, 12 years old. It had been on the shelf for 12 years. When I touched the package with my hands, it literally disintegrated. The blue wrap disintegrated in my hands. And when I pulled it off the shelf, it was like this uh, explosion of blue powder that went up into the air and it flowed down on me and got on my scrubs, got all over the floor. And it was, it was, it looked like a blue powder bomb had gone off in the department right there. And it was just from the disintegration of these materials. So 12 years was how long that took. And obviously there was dust on the top of that shelf. There was air currents moving over it. There was other things that were breaking down that product. But according to what most people think of as event related, that should have been a sterile item. It, it, nothing had happened to it. It was sitting there sterile, but over 12 years, it had broken down to the point where it was definitely not gonna be sterile inside. So keep those things in mind. And really do you want something on the shelf for five years, six years, something like that? Probably not. You probably wanna do some form of stock rotation. Let's look at some other factors that can impact sterility. So Amy guidelines uh, state to refer to manufacturer IFUs whenever you're stacking wrapped items. Stacking wrapped trays may lead to an event that causes an item to be unsterile. Um, so even though Amy guidelines don't necessarily say don't stack wrapped trays, some of your wrapped manufacturers will say in their IFUs, do not stack wrapped trays and you have to follow their IFU. There are other things to consider with wrapped trays as well. For example, not all trays have uniform flat tops and flat bottoms. If you look at Cynthia's trays, a lot of these trays have those burgundy notches at the top where we lock the lids in place. 
And those are things on the top of a wrap that can cause problems as well as the bottoms of trays where there's little rubber notches or little feet uh, to try to prevent holes in them. As we're taking these things on and off of each other, there's a lot of uh, possibility for damage to the wrapped items. So consider also that wrapped items have tape on them, often along uh, their tops and along their bottoms. And you also should be thinking about the weight of the wrap trays as well. Um, the more weight that's on them as you're pulling these things off, and I think about this one over here on the right especially, as you're pulling some of these items like on that third shelf or second shelf off, those things are gonna be rubbing and tearing against everything next to them and underneath them. Uh, let's say you needed to get the bottom tray on that third shelf down. Are you gonna be able to lift those other things up to pull it out? I mean, it's really kind of iffy of whether or not you're gonna be able to do that. So you have to consider the weight of the wrap trays as well. You can stack them. There's nothing in Amy says you can't. Look at your wrap IFU and say if it says you can't, and then just use common sense. The more you have these things stacked, the more likely events will have happened to cause them to become unsterile. So top 10 things you need to know. Number eight, true or false, stacking wrap trays is good practice in the sterile storage area. That's gonna be false. It's not considered good practice to wrap to stack wrapped trays. Follow IFUs, look for guidance on the amount that you can stack or the weight of items, and then just use common sense. The more you do it, the more likely it is you're gonna cause events, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Some more factors that impact sterility, let's look at rigid containers. These are better protection for instrumentation to maintain sterility and to avoid events that can cause them to become unsterile. They're, they're just a better system for protecting the instruments inside. They don't get holes in them like wraps. Uh, sometimes you can put holes in the um, filter, but you, they're a lot harder to do that than with the wrapped items. So there are definite advantages to them, but there are things you need to consider with rigid containers as well. The first thing is that disposable filters often have shelf life considerations, just like peel pouches and uh, disposable wraps. So look at your shelf life considerations. Some of them are as short as six months. Uh, they can only have that filter in there for six months and maintain sterility. Other things that you need to look at, stacking of rigid containers can also lead to major issues. And you wanna think about how that rigid container is sealed. And we don't often think about this. We just see, seal it, we don't really think about it. The gasket of the wrapped item is essentially has that rubber, you can see it in red there, it's like a rubber edge um, that's going to create the seal. And it's pressed down against the sharp edge of the container. And where it presses down, when you latch it closed, you're gonna feel that pressure of the sharp part of the lid or the sharp part of the container pressing into the gasket of the lid. And that's how that uh, seal is made that will maintain sterility after the sterilization cycle. The sterilin will go through the filters, uh, through into contact all surfaces inside the set, but it will not necessarily be able to get in or out and no air or microorganisms can get in and out of that seal created by the gasket and the tray itself. So what I see in sterile processing, if you stack rigid containers too high, you need to look at your IFUs for rigid containers. Sometimes they'll say, do not stack more than three items uh, something like that in their IFUs. If you stack them too high, you're risking damaging the gasket because of all the weight and the pressure. And then once you remove that pressure, once you remove all the weight of items being stacked, the gasket may have been warped so badly that when the lid and the container separate, it causes contaminated air to enter the container. So it the sharp edge pressed into the gasket, you put hundreds of pounds on top of it. I see these uh, challenges on like Facebook or uh, LinkedIn sometimes where it'll be like, how many rigid containers can you carry? And it'll be like, guys, these muscly guys are carrying eight to 10 rigid containers on top of each other. And this is what I think about. I think about that gasket on the bottom that's getting pressed down with hundreds of pounds of weight on top of it. And then as soon as they remove that pressure, that gasket's gonna lift and now that tray's no longer gonna be sterile. So that's the things my mind goes to is those gaskets. And I put it as my one of my top 10 things you need to know, number nine here. Uh, what area of the rigid container can be damaged by stacking them too high or too heavy? And the answer is the gasket. So let's get into endoscope storage. The 2021 update to ST79 provides some new guidance for the storage of flexible endoscopes. We're gonna dive into what that ST91 actually states about the storage of endoscopes, and then figure out what's changed, what's new, 
and all these things that we have to uh, update in our departments to comply with the new standards. So ANSI Amy ST91 says endoscopes are to be stored in an area that's clean, well ventilated, and dust free in order to keep the endoscopes dry and prevent exposure to potentially hazardous microbial contamination. They should be stored in a manner that will protect them from damage or contamination and in accordance with the endoscope and storage cabinet manufacturer's written IFU. It's pretty standard. It's pretty similar to the language that was in the first one. You need to have a storage cabinet, and that storage cabinet needs to protect the scopes from contamination. Also from that section, before storage, the channels of the high-level disinfected endoscope should be dry to prevent bacterial growth as well as the formation of biofilm. There's a lot of references, and this is the thing I love about the new ST91, there's a lot of references in it um, that are talking about specific studies that have been done on water left in channels and then microorganisms or pathogens that grow in the presence of water. Remember the inside of the endoscope is a damp, uh, dark environment, perfect for microbial growth. So if there's any kind of water left, even after high level disinfection, it's creating a perfect environment for microorganisms to thrive. So it did add this section that drying the scopes is a really important step. These things have to or should be dry before they're put into storage. Endoscopes should be stored either vertically or horizontally in a cabinet that's designed for storage in a way to allow the circulation of air. So I want to, th I want to bring up something that I think is of note with this. In Amy ST91, it states there is no consensus on the maximum storage time that should be allowed for a high-level disinfected endoscope. There's no guidance on seven-day hang time, 14-day, 28-day. Hospitals need to come up with their own policies on the hang time of scopes and use manufacturer recommendations as well as Amy ST91 as their guide for what the hang time is going to be. And it does allow for that horizontal uh, airflow um, storage as well. But I do want to provide a little bit of clarity on what it states about the horizontal kind of forced air or um, the filtered air uh, that's doing the active drying. So as the MEST 91 does have this sentence, methods that employ active drying of endoscopes with filtered air are the preferred means of drying the internal channels of endoscopes after processing. Active drying means it has filtered air flowing through the scope and it's providing that active air is providing the drying, whereas before we would hang it and assume that gravity was taking care of it or the alcohol flush we did at the end was taking care of it and assuming those things were dry when we realized through studies they weren't. So the thing I want to point out about this for clarity is it says that filtered air is preferred. The, the active drying of filtered air is preferred. Uh, Amy language is very clear. If there's a should statement, you should be doing that. If you have a shall statement in Amy guidelines, that's essentially as strong as the language can get in an Amy document. And if you see must in an Amy document, that really goes to a regulation. There's some kind of federal regulation that's stating must, so Amy language will mirror the must. But there's no nothing here that states you have to do any of this. Yes, the active drying with filtered air is preferred. It's better to do that because we see the results when scopes are not dry. But do you have to right now go out and spend $25,000 on a new filtered air cabinet providing active drying? No. But if your hospital is going to purchase a new storage cabinet, why not pur purchase the preferred method of drying, which is, again, the active drying with filtered air? So I think there's a lot of misconception that you're going to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars right off the bat to comply with Amy ST91. Amy ST91 was a huge step in the right direction. Uh, but there's not a lot of musts, shalls, or shoulds when it comes to this equipment. It's only providing best practice recommendations. And again, here it says preferred means, not necessarily something you have to do. So the last one on my top 10 things you need to know, true or false per Amy ST91, scope subjected to HLD or liquid chemical sterilization must be placed in endoscope drying cabinets with forced air. That is false. Preferred method, not something that you have to do. In conclusion here, transporting from the point of use to decontamination, regardless of the distance between them, should accomplish those four main goals, removal of gross soil, prevention of damage, prevention of cross-contamination, as well as keeping others safe.
We also have storage requirements that are not the same for each uh, department or site. So make sure you know your ASHRAE or ASHRAE 170 standards for your facility. Event-related sterility refers to the concept that items will remain sterile until an event occurs to make them unsterile, but expiration dates or shelf life dates can also be events. And the last thing here I wanna say is that always, regardless of everything I've said in this presentation, look at your IFUs for your products, for your devices, for your chemical solutions, all those things for the proper guidance. And then if you were interested in anything we saw here, there's a lot of documentation, uh, Amy ST 79, Amy ST 91, the eighth edition manual, all those things that I cited uh, as proper guidance to look for uh, for storage of, of items. From all of us here at Healthmark, I sincerely want to say thank you for all that you do for taking care of patients. And please have a happy CS week, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching and for being a part of Healthmark's seven days of CEUs. If I could ask just one small favor in return, please like this video and subscribe to the Healthmark Education channel so we can continue to spread the word of education to as many CS technicians as we possibly can. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for everything you do for patients, and we hope you have a very happy CS week.